linear mean square error estimation. Uh, it immediately shows two things if you see this title that in any estimation problem there has to be a signal model. Actually you, what you are trying to say is that you are, you are trying to estimate some quantity <laughs> which you cannot probably measure or uh, I mean you, you are trying to estimate it in terms of other quantities or you are trying to predict something whose value is not available or something is very noisy. So you want to estimate the actual correct thing and you always have the noisy measurement. So in general what happens is that you have some signals at hand which are called measurements and you want to get something else which you cannot measure directly. That is, that is a typical, that is the estimation problem. Now the problem, now the thing is that first of all there are two things that will characterize it. The first thing that will characterize it is called a, is called a model set. That is, in general, the set of, you will have to have some rule of computing that quantity producing the estimate based on the measurement. In fact, that is the estimator. So, so you cannot, in general, I mean, there are, there are, there are so many possible rules. I mean, all possible linear, nonlinear, dynamic functions, etc., etc., that it is not feasible to leave that question open. So, people will generally focus their scope that okay if i am if i am looking for a looking for a solution to the problem i am looking for this kind of uh, signal model let us say in this class we will we will see that we are we are we will be looking for a solution using a particular kind of signal model so we will try to find out some estimator which is of that structure okay. so that's why this term linear has come and now there are so many possible linear systems. So the, so the question is which one of them will you pick up as a good estimator? So you need to define a, a, a performance criterion by which you can assess whether the estimate is good or not, right? And there could be several possible performance indexes and mean square error is, is the performance index that we are going to consider today. So you see that with every estimation problem, there will have to be a signal model and there will have to and there will have to be a performance criterion then then these two things are essential quantities which characterize any estimation problem okay so what do we do in this particular estimation problem so this is the problem initially we consider the problem in a kind of a general setting and then we'll show that this problem can be applied in several practical cases. So the problem is to design an estimator that computes an estimate y hat n of y n. So y n is the signal that we want to estimate. We cannot estimate that value, we cannot measure it. So we, so we produce an estimate of y n which is called the y hat n. And we produce this estimate using a linear combination of data. So, so these are my, my, my measurements. So I have k measurements, k signals, where k varies between 1 to m. Each signal I have at different sampling instance. And based on these k signals at a given sampling instance, I want to generate an estimate y hat n of y n. Now, what should be the estimate property? It should be generated such that yn minus y hat n magnitude whole square. In fact, you do not need to put magnitude. You can put magnitude if this y is a vector, this y could be a vector in general. But let us think of scalar only now. So yn minus y hat n whole square is minimized. That is, if you use any other y hat n, other than using that particular rule which is the which is the MMAC estimator, if you use any other linear estimator, then that will definitely give you a more error. You want to construct it in such a way that among the linear estimators, it will give you the mean, it will give you the minimum mean square error. Among the nonlinear estimators can still do better. So maybe you could construct a construct a neural network which will give you a still better still lower estimation error. But among the linear ones, no one will, 
<coughs> it's, it will not be possible to give a better estimate. So we want to construct such an estimate. So when we say linear, combi <coughs> linear combination of data, we mean that I, I want to generate y hat n using a rule such as this, ckn xn. So I want to compute, uh, thi this, this is what I want to find out, what are these going to be? Such that if I feed it to a data and generate an estimate, this condition will be satisfied. This is the problem, okay? <coughs> Now let us first, so, so this means that for every time instant, I'm going to choose a different coefficient, right? At every n for, for estimating y, y hat 1, I'm going to get a set of m coefficients. For estimating y hat 2, I'm going to get a set of, set of coefficients, etc. This is the most general problem, okay? So let us first see what is, this, what, is the, what is the elementary problem which I have to solve if I have to get this. That is, if I want to solve it for some particular n, so if I freeze n, choose n is equal to something, then what happens is that these, these stochastic processes will now become random variables. So now you have to find the problem such that y hat is equal to c k x k, find out this c k. So I am just freezing n, so I am eliminating, I am removing it from the equation. So y hat is now a random variable, x k's are other random variables which are measured and I want to, <coughs> actually y is a random variable and I want to estimate y hat based on these random variables using these coefficients. Now what should be the coefficients? That is the question. So now what is y minus y hat? It is y minus, see this equation, if I have k equal to 1 to m, I can always write it like a vector matrix where this c hat, this is my problem, I, I cannot write here properly, so I will write here. So what this c hat? is a vector. Whenever I give an under bar, it is a vector because I cannot show bold or anything here. So it is C1, Cn and this x hat is equal to x1, xn. These are the two vectors. Actually, they are transposes. That is, they are column vectors. So naturally, this can be written as C transpose x. Okay. So now what is, wha what do I want to minimize? So I have a performance criterion, which is a function of my weight. And I want to minimize it. I want to choose such a C, such that the value of this performance criterion will be minimum. So what is the performance criterion? It is expectation of Y minus Y hat. So Y hat is C transpose X, I have just defined. So it is Y minus C transpose X into Y minus X transpose C. This I have written in this fashion. If it is a scalar, it does not matter because y minus c transpose x is a scalar, so I could have written even whole square. But, but in general, it will be a matrix, so I have written it as if, which will satisfy even a matrix case. So the a matrix's norm squared means that x transpose x. So if you say norm, that is, if you say x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared plus x4 squared, etc., then you can write it in matrix notation as x transpose x. So I am writing the error vector transpose error vector. Actually, this should have been y transpose in that case. Anyway, so now if you multiply, what will happen? You will get expectation of y square. Just multiply this and then, then you distribute the linear operator, uh, the, the expectation operator. So you have expectation of y square minus c transpose, c is a constant. So it has, it is not a random variable. So therefore, the C transpose expectation of x, y minus expectation of y, x transpose. This is, if you multiply this to this, you get this term. If you multiply this with this, you get this term. Just, just term by term multiplication. C transpose, you get this term. So this is how your performance criterion depends on C. Now you have to choose a C which will minimize this. That is the problem. Okay. So that is very simple actually, but, but but before we do that, we need to find, need to know the properties of this matrix, expectation of x, x transpose or the autocorrelation matrix, okay? Firstly, obviously R is symmetric. What is the expectation of x, x transpose? If you have a vector, if you have a vector, I have to write like this. I hope you can read this. 
So if you have a vector x is equal to x1 to xn, it is a column vector actually, then what is x x transpose? Expect the, the general ijth element of this matrix, this will be a matrix, it is a column into a row. So the ijth element will be given by expectation of xi xj. So obviously the jth element will be expectation of xj xi which is equal to the ijth element. So this matrix is symmetric. If the jith element of a ma of a matrix is equal to its ijth element, this is symmetric. It is also positive definite. Now what is what is meant by positive definite? For a matrix, positive definite means that if you take any vector a and evaluate this quantity a transpose r a, this will be a scalar. See a matrix you are taking say 2 into 2, you are multiplying it by A transpose and multiplying this by A. So you will get a scalar, this into this plus this into this, this, will, this is going to be a row multiplied by a column. This will generally give what is known as a quadratic form. So therefore this, if the matrix R is such that for all vectors A, which only if the vector is identically 0, that is 0, 0, 0, 0 element, then this has to be 0. Otherwise, you choose any other vector A, it should be non-zero. The R is, it should be positive. The R is such. Then, then, then the matrix R is called positive definite. Now, this R is positive definite. Why? Because if you choose any A, then what is A transpose R A? It is A transpose into expect. I am just substituting this. Now you take this expectation out, then you get expectation of A transpose X into X transpose A. Now this is a scalar. This is a scalar. They are they are actually the same scalar. So so suppose A transpose X is B, then you have expectation of B square, which cannot be negative. So therefore, for any other, for all A, R is this is going to be positive. That's why the matrix, the the correlation matrix is positive definite symmetric okay this is a property of r which is fairly obvious to see now let us minimize that there are there are two approaches you can this is the this is the you know more this is an approach where what what i have done is see i have just because i because i know the result i i, I have written it you can see that this this performance criterion this one let us put it here, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I can put it here. See this performance criterion can be cast like this, where D is expectation of XY. See this is, this is D, this, if, if this is D, this is, this is D transpose, okay. So you have, now what I have, simply what I have done, now if you, if you just multiply this, what is going to happen? You are going to get terms like, by the way, A plus B whole transpose is equal to A transpose plus B transpose. So, and AB transpose equal to B transpose A transpose. I think you know these things. So, suppose you multiply this, this term is going to give, after this transpose is taken out, it will be C transpose R. R is symmetric, so therefore R transpose is R. This R multiplied by this R inverse will give you, will give you identity. Rather, this R multiplied this R inverse. Actually, if you if you just break it up, you will get that this term. Basically, this term can be cast like this. That is very simple to to do. If you just break it up, I, I don't need to uh, explain it too much. This is just a, this is just. I mean, this this uh, it, this has been done in one step because the result is known. So now, once you can break it up, now you see that obviously this part does not depend on C. This part only depends on x and y. Okay, so they are in no way dependent on the choice of c. So by choosing c, you cannot affect this part. By choosing c, you can only affect this part. Now, if R is a positive definite matrix, obviously R inverse is is also positive definite. If 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 x is positive, one by x is also positive. So therefore, this term can only be greater than or equal to zero. This this is now the vector A. So A transpose R inverse A is 
greater than zero because this is positive definite which means that the this performance criterion can only be can only be greater than this it can only increase by by this amount and when is it going to be least when this vector is identically zero or when so this is minimum if rc is equal to b if that condition is satisfied then you get the weight which will make this performance criterion minimum right so 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 this is how you get c this is one way the other way is which we all know that is simply differentiate only thing is that here you have vectors so you have to differentiate with respect to vectors but that's simple so the other approach is simply take dpc of dc now remember that this pc is a scalar it is a performance index so it is a scalar and this c is a vector so what do we mean by by differentiating a vector uh, differentiating a scalar with a vector this is this is a standard notation this this actually has is a symbol which means this that it means that dpc by dc1 dpc by dcm it is a, it is a vector first differentiate pc with respect to c1 then with c2 then with c3 and put them in a vector Th this is a notation which means this okay so now we do if we do dpc dc1 look, look at this this part if you if you just differentiate it what you will get this term will go away because it does not have a dependency and in this term uh, okay it is it, it is easier to see it from here you know you see it from here because they are same so if you differentiate it with respect to c this term will be zero this term will give what it will give minus c or rather it will give minus this is d this is d this is d transpose so if you take minus c transpose d and then you differentiate it with respect to c what do you get you will get d or rather minus d why because because what is c transpose d c transpose d is equal to c1 <coughs> d1 plus c2 d2 plus dot 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 so if you differentiate it with respect to any ci so dpc by dci any particular one you will get di so when you so here you will get d1 here you will get d2 and then at dcm you will get dm so you will get the vector d itself back okay so so here you get minus minus d here also you get minus d because c transpose d and d transpose c are same thing so you here you get minus d here you get minus d and here what do you get it's like x square i mean you can you can actually turn by turn do it and see but because it is it is x square if you, x square if you differentiate it, it is like c square na c transpose c so it is like a x square right so if you get that then you will get twice rc if you if you take a x square and if you differentiate it with respect to x you get twice a x you can do it turn by turn just like i did it here you can again multiply c transpose actually take c1 c2 cm and then take r11 r12 r13 and do it there is no problem so if you differentiate you actually get this now just setting this equal to 0 does not ensure that it is a minimum you have to also see that the second derivative is positive only then it is a minimum otherwise it will be a maximum so if you do d2 pc dc square that is you, you again differentiate it with d d c then you will get twice r and we know that r is positive definite so it is greater than equal to 0 this is a matrix therefore it is a minimum okay so now if we set it to 0 then we get the same equation back that is r c equal to d so this so the optimal weight must satisfy this relationship that r c equal to d okay fairly simple problem discovered long back in 1940s 
Now the question is how do you solve this equation? So, so R c equal to d, we have to, we, have, we have to compute c, so we have to solve this equation. Okay, obviously, you know, as long as we do not go to the computer, do not work by hand, the, the I mean notationally we always write obviously c naught equal to R, R inverse d. That is very easy to write, yeah, but it is much more difficult to compute. Nobody does R inverse d because, R, because I mean computing R inverse is computationally very heavy. So therefore, obvious ways, I mean the I mean a notational way to say that you compute C not equal to R inverse D, you, you actually cannot do that, I mean you actually should not do that. What is the other way? The other way is to solve the equation R C equal to D, just like you solve A x equal to B by doing uh, Gaussian elimination. So you, you will find A x, so like that you can find C. That is a that is a better way than inverting it. You can also inversion is about inversion will be about three times a more expensive than this. I mean there exist I mean computational complexity results which will show that if you want to invert, you will spend about three times the effort than this. And sometimes what you do is you will these are you know advanced methods of numerical linear algebra. That is you, any, if R is a positive definite matrix, then it can be shown that R is, R can be factored like this, where L is a lower triangular matrix, you know what is a lower triangular matrix, that is elements are like this, here it is 0, this is lower triangular matrix. So R can always, if R is positive definite, symmetric, then R can always be factored as L D L transpose, where this L is a, is a lower triangular matrix, D is a diagonal matrix and U is an, basically L transpose is an upper triangular matrix, okay, sometimes it is also called L D U factorization. So it can be factori factorized like this, what is the advantage, why do I want to factorize like this, because solving triangular set of equations is trivial. If you have this sort of an equation into x is equal to b, it is trivial to solve it. Just if you will have x1 equal to b1, then you substitute that, you get x2, you substitute those two, you get x3. It is extremely simple if you triangularize the equations. So if you have LDL transpose, then, then you, you can solve it in two, two simple steps. First you, first you assume that, that L transpose c is equal to k, some vector. So then you solve LDK is equal to d. See, D is diagonal, so therefore LD is also triangular. So first you solve for LDK equal to D, which is a lower triangular system. Then once you get K, then you solve L transpose C equal to K. That is an upper triangular system. So, so both are extremely easy to solve. So this is a, you know, um, sort of a modern way to solve these equations, okay, which are also numerically stable. Now there is a beautiful principle which is very profound in, in, in linear estimation and we will come back again and again, that is the principle of orthogonality which says that the error that is basic, basic idea is that if you are, see you are estimating y, okay, suppose y is a vector in some space and you are estimating y. Let us say with other vectors x, okay. So you are you you have these vectors which are your measurements, and you want to estimate these vectors. And in this case, you are you are generating the you are generating the estimate by linearly combining x's, which means that whatever is your estimate, it's going to be on this plane. If you take a linear combination of two vectors, it is going to be on the same plane, right? So that means all your estimates are actually on in this plane. Now, now suppose suppose this is an estimate. This is an estimate which you have generated using these two vectors on this plane. So, so what is the error? Error is this vector norm of that is length of this this minus this this vector now the question is when is this this norm going to be minima 
that is what we want to find when we, if you drop a perpendicular on on this plane that is where it is going to be minimum so which means that the error vector is going to be perpendicular to all these vectors necessarily right this is a this is a principle which is which is satisfied in 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 many many cases and which has a very nice geometrical interpretation okay so so what it means so now the the principle of orthogonality says that this error e which is defined as not only e just not just e e for the optimal estimate not for any estimate c so now i have i have substituted the optimal estimate c not if you put the optimal estimate c not still you will get some error let that error be e not so y minus x transpose c not is going to be your e not this is the error right this is your y hat so it says that the expectation of x e not which means that what is the that is it, now this expectation of x and e not that is if you take a product if you take a product of x and e not they are going to be and if you take expectation over all possible random variables is going to be zero why that you can prove, prove because you have the way you have chosen c not so ex expectation of x into e not is y e not i have just just substituted then i have broken up so you again get the equation d minus r c not d minus r c not so basically d minus r c not the way i have chosen it d is r c not because it is c not now so it is zero so which means that the error is going to be orthogonal to all measurements that you are using fact number 1 and and obviously since this y hat is generated linearly using all the elements of x so so it is also on the same plane so it is going to be orthogonal to to y hat also this is this principle will come back and back and back in 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 most mean square estimators that is the moment you want to estimate you know want to minimize the length of a vector which is a which is a quadratic norm you will always get that the that the error is going to be perpendicular to the to the measurement which you use that's the way to make it minimum length okay so this is a very profound thing which we'll get back now let's specialize this case previously we did not know what is xk what is uh, we, uh, we took a fairly general case that is xk are some measurements of some other quantities and why is some other how they are related we 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 we, we did not bother right so now we'll we, we are we'll consider several uh, special cases for example one one standard problem is to define that if you if you, that you have a single input now i'm specializing you know various cases that is now you don't have previously i had taken k measurements x k's and each one i was assuming a vector often what we do is we choose suppose we are we have a we have some desired response okay and we want and we have got some inputs now what i what i want to know is that what is that filter through which if i pass this input i will get this output very close to this output this is a this is a valid problem okay so then you write so now we are talking about linear filters okay so when we are talking about linear filters obviously so now my x1 x2 xm are are the samples of the same signal so now i have so i'm i'm now specializing the 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 first problem that i have done this is a this is a this is a case we'll get we can have many other cases which are of great practical importance which we can solve by exactly the same method so here now i am defining y hat n as this so i am now trying to generate the estimate of y hat n using the past estimates of x you know rather the using the past measurements of x and i want to compute these okay so because why i have written it like this because this filter is linear and not only linear it is fir means it is finite impulse response see normally the impulse response 
if it is an arbitrary linear filter, then it should be h 0 m basically it should be 0 to infinity. If it is a causal filter, if it is an if it is a non causal filter, it should be minus infinity to plus infinity. But so here I, we are talking about causal and FIR filter. So FIR filter means that after some time the 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 impulse response sequence goes to 0. So only there are finitely many h1, h2, h3, h4 up to hm. After m greater than 0, hm is 0. So that is why this summation gets truncated. Okay. So that is why it is optimal FIR filter. And naturally, so if so you see that that estimating this filter is the same problem that we have considered previously. It is our old problem. So h n k we can call them c k n and put a <coughs> put uh, 0 to m minus 1 I can put I, 1 is equal to m. So, so this is I have just changed the indices here and there and I am trying to show that this is the same problem that we have solved previously. Again I am trying to estimate c k. Only now my x k's are x n minus k plus 1. It is a samples of the same signal. So it is the same problem. So the problem of estimating this filter such that if you give x n input, you will get y n output close to y n output is the same same problem that we have already solved. So we will get this equation again. Only we will have to put appropriate vectors in this case. So in this case, what is so again we will get a, it is the same problem. So again, c zero n will give you this R m. I mean, R inverse d, the same thing you will get. Now in this case, what is the what does R look like? What was R? R was x i x j. Previously, what was R? The i j th element of R is expectation of x i x j. Now, what is x i here? See, see this x n. So, it is what is x i? It is x n minus i plus 1. You put i is equal to 1, you get x n. You put i is equal to 2, you will get x n minus 1. You put i is equal to m, you get, you get x n minus m plus 1. Okay. So this is x i. So what is x n minus i plus, so what is a, it is x n minus j plus 1 expectation. This is r i j in this case. I will just put x i x j. Now what is this? This is nothing but the if the if the R process is stationary, then then expectation of x i x j is equal to R x x i minus j. It does not depend on what is i, what is j. It just depends on i and j difference. Remember stationary process, wide sense stationary. So the mean is constant, and the Autocorrelation is depends only on the difference between two points, right? So x t x t plus tau will give you R x s tau. So 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 if you do that, you will get here you will get R x x zero up to this. So so you will get these terms. So it's so it's again symmetric. You can see, and this so this is what R looks like in this particular problem. It's a just just a special case. Okay, and this is what D looks like. So again, you have to compute. You have to solve for R C zero equal to D equation, right? <coughs> See, this is a this is a general problem. Okay, general linear signal estimation. That is, what is what we are doing is that. We have this signal x k s. These are my measurements, and you have this signal y k. So this is x one. <coughs> now, that was our original problem. Okay. So in this case, we don't have that. In this case, we what we have is we have only one of them, <coughs> and we have several samples. Okay. So so suppose. In general, I can define a problem in which I can to generate a particular, suppose I want to generate this one, 
that is y in. So the question is what data I am going to use? So I can in general use data from some k1 to kp. If I have the whole strings, suppose I have acquired data using some data acquisition card, I have, I have, I have acquired data and I have got the whole strings x stored in my computer. Then, in, then there is no problem, all the values are available. This is not an online case that, that, that as signal is coming, I want to do something. Signal is already there from, let us say, from 0 to infinity. So then for, for estimating this yn, I can in general use any time some span of x and then see what will be best. Maybe if you vary this, we will we will get better result actually, <coughs> right. So in general, I can define a problem in which and it is also of interest sometimes that, that we want to generate the, that is using the, using these measurements, we can also try to generate xn, that is we are going to use data from xk1 to xk2, we, sh we will not use x the value of xn and we want to estimate what is going to, what is xn, this is also possible. This problem is of importance because of two things. Because of the fact, for example, we will we, we'll just see special cases. So we can define a, define an estimator where I want to I want to see I am standing at n, suppose. I am standing at time instant n. Okay. I am here. This is n. So if I am here, even if data is coming, streaming in, then I have all data from 0 to n I have. Now in general I can try to uh, try to generate an estimate of x n minus i using data from n to n minus n. It is possible that is I use the data from this to this to generate x n minus i while I, now you see xn minus i is contained here, so I do not use xn minus i, I use other thing. So that is why you are trying to generate a linear estimator using data from xn, you put k equal to 0, you will get xn, put k is equal to capital M, you will get n minus n and you are not using xi and you want to generate an, uh, you are not using xn minus i and you want to generate an estimate of xn minus i. This is a problem, this is a general problem. Now what are the special cases? A simple special case is putting a put i is equal to 0, you will get a prediction problem. That is, you now have data from n minus 1 to n minus n and you want to generate n, right. So you are using past data to obtain future, that is prediction, which is a very, very important problem used in many, many cases. So if you, if you specialize the case for i is equal to 0, you will get a predictor. That is why I sort of, you know, if you just solve a general problem, you, you, you get everything. Similarly, there is, <coughs> there is something called a backward linear prediction. If you see DSP books, they will say forward linear prediction and backward linear prediction. Actually, backward linear prediction is a bit of a, I mean, I am not comfortable with the term because, for, because, for, because prediction in English usually means going forward. But so, so basically back, what backward linear prediction means is that you use now you see, you use from xn to xn minus 1, so you have, you have got future data and after you got some more data, you want to estimate a past value. So you are there, you are not going forward in time, but you are going backward in time. So you have all your future samples you are using to estimate a past value. That is also, sometimes it is called smoothing. This thing is called smoothing, that is after you have you had some measurements now, but after you have many other measurements, you can make a better guess of that, especially when the signal is noisy. So this, in this way, you can define several uh, special problems, all of which will form in the same way and all of which can be solved by exactly in the same way by solving the normal equation. That is what I am trying to show. Okay. Now we have what we call a, this is the, this is, this is the origin of this, you know, there, there, there is a great mathematician called Norbert Wiener who actually formulated this problem and solved it in 1940s and 
actually this Wiener, Kolmogorov, these are the I mean fathers of modern uh, <coughs> statistical signal pricing. So in fact Wiener and Kolmogorov both, both solved it I, I mean independently around the same time this problem, okay. Wiener solved it in continuous domain, Kolmogorov solved it in discrete domain and as usual it is, it is known more by the name of Wiener than by Kolmogorov because because Wiener comes from the Western world. <coughs> so, uh, so here we are defining y hat n like this. And what is this? This is a non-causal infinite impulse response filter. So it is the most general case. I am not saying that it is going to be causal. So I have taken minus infinity to plus infinity. And since I have taken up to infinity, it means that it is infinite impulse response. So that is this is the most general case. Okay. So again, the same thing. Only thing is that only here there is a problem. What is the problem? The problem is that the 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 number of terms are infinite. So all the matrix sizes, everything is going to be infinite. So you cannot really write a matrix equation here because the matrices, number of rows, number of columns, everything is infinite. That is why you write it in a different way, but it is the same equation. So you see, again if you, if, you, if you apply principle of orthogonality, what do you get? You get each element x n minus k is going to be orthogonal to the error. That is this c k should be chosen in such a manner that this is your error, this is your model. So y n minus y hat n is your error. So the error is going to be orthogonal to all the data that you have used to generate it. Principle of orthogonality says that the error is going to be orthogonal to all the data that you have used to, to generate the estimate which gave that error. So the, so, so the data which you have used to, to generate the estimate are these. So if you take any one of them, the error is going to be orthogonal. Correct, and and this will hold for all data. Now k varies from minus, so you, you can take k anywhere. Actually, actually this need not be zero, one, two. It can be minus infinity to plus infinity. So initially I put it for a causal filter, then I cha have changed the notation. That's why I did not change it here. It should be minus infinity to plus infinity. So if you do that now. This equation you can you can write in a different way because because you do not simply because you cannot write it in terms of a matrix because the matrix is of infinite size. So now you have to write it in terms of in a, in a different way. It is the same matrix again. So now I will write I'll again multiply and I'll put these terms on the left hand side. You put these terms on the right hand side. Again now it's an infinite summation. So you, so you get this is this is your correlation matrix. Okay, R X Y between y, uh, this is, no, no, no. If I, if, I, if I define this as the autocorrelation matrix, x, x n minus k, n minus i will, will be r, x x, i minus k or k minus i, all the same. And d of minus k is equal to d k again and that is x n minus k y n. This is what I am defining. This is clear to you? The correlation matrix, so the correlation matrix will depend on the difference between the indices. So what is n minus, what is the index here n minus k? The index here is n minus y. So what is the difference i minus k? It's as simple as that. So if you put that, then then if you put these notations, these are just notations. I'm just in, in, in place of these cumbersome sums, I'm giving the names. Then I can write this. Then now you put it here. So you here you will get ck0 into rk minus i or i minus k, all the same, and dk. So this equation is very famous. It's called the Wiener-Hopf equation. So for this general problem, you have to solve CK by 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 solving what is known as the Wiener-Hopf equation for all k. So you have an infinite set of equations from which you have to solve these elements. These 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 infinite sets of elements. Now now point is how do you do that? How do you solve an infinite set of unknowns from an infinite <coughs> set of equations? So for doing that, 
what you can do is actually what people do is this, this is why frequency domain is so useful. Actually, there are some cases where you can get nice closed form solutions of this problem. It's not that it's not that this problem is uh, not solvable just because you have an infinite number of terms. So, for doing that, <coughs> what you can do is you just observe that what is this? This looks like a convolution integral. No, this this is ck into r k minus i. In the previous case, we had h k x n minus k, and and you are summing over i, right. So, you see that you have this is this is like a convolution integral. So, if you take a z transform of this, convolution will become product. So, then you will get if you take z transform on the left hand side, you will get cz, which is your filter transfer function. After all, what is cz? These are your impulse response coefficient. So, C z is sigma minus infinity is what is C z? C z is sigma minus infinity to plus infinity C k z to the power minus k. So, this term will, will this is a convolution of two convolution of the impulse response sequence with the, in, with the input so called input which is the correlation sequence. So, if you take z transform you will here you will get the filter transfer function C z and here you will get S x x z which is the power spectrum of x autocorrelation function if you take if you take Fourier if, if you take z transform what will you get you will get the power spectrum and this here you will get cross power spectrum of S x and y. So, the prop so, so what is the why did we do this I mean what is the beauty of this. Now, the beauty of this is that if you can estimate this and if you can estimate this by some other means then by simply dividing you will get the transfer function c z which may or may not be a rational in the rational form remember that all transfer functions are not rational in the sense that that every transfer function cannot be expressed as a ratio of two polynomials b z by a z. Now, for example, there are there are there are various cases for example, e to the power z e to the power z is not expressible as, as uh, b z by a z it is expressible only if you take an infinite number of terms. So, e to the power z is an irrational transfer function, it is still a transfer function, right. So, here also you can at least if you just numerically if you compute S x x and from the signal and numerically if you compute S x y, then simply by dividing these two power spectrums you can get C z, at least you can get the form, then you can approximate C z in some way. But what I am trying to say is that it is practically possible to solve for C z in some cases. It is not that it is not possible if you go to the frequency domain. So, I mean this is how the Wiener equation is generally solved ok and, and this is why frequency domain is so, so interesting. You see even, even 1 by 1 minus z which is a nice transfer function it also has an infinite number of comp uh, uh, coefficients if you see it as 1 plus z plus z inverse then it has infinite number of components, but so what does not mean that it cannot be represented very compactly using a transfer function 1 by 1 minus z, it can be. <coughs> so, so for example, this this problem we can now apply to, to this case, see this is a very very common case that is if you, you have you have a even some actual signal y which is corrupted with some noise v and this is your measurement x. Now, from x you want to estimate what was the what was the actual value this, this is one of the central problems in instrumentation. There is some actual process variable you want to sense it when you sense it you get noise mixed with it. So, from the measurement can you get the actual process variable standard problem very very common. So, so what will happen now we apply our theory to it. If we apply our theory to it, then we will get that our non-causal filter H z. So now, what 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 is R x x? R x x is R y y plus R v v. Just take R x x because because y and v are v are assumed uncorrelated, so all x y terms will get all y v terms will go to zero. So you get only y square and v square terms. So you get R y y plus R v v. There is no cross term here because I have assumed that y and v are uncorrelated. And 
Now, what is Ryx? Ryx is nothing but Ryx. So, if you multiply y here, you get Ryy and you get Ryv. Ryv is 0 because they, again they are uncorrelated. So, Ryx is Ryl. So, now you apply this, this. So, so you, you, what do you have? You have what is the optimal filter? It is Sxy by Sxx by solving the Wiener Hoff equation in the frequency domain. So, you get so the non causal filter is SYY in this case the so it is SYY by because SYX is equal to SYY and here you have to put SXX which is which is SYY plus SV right. So, if you have some knowledge about the noise so if you know if you know this and this you can you can compute this. Or in other words, if you know even this and this S xx and svv, then also you can compute this because because from, from because sxx if you know, how will you know sxx? You will have to actually take the measurements. X is the measurement, so it is available. So you can estimate sxx, and if you know what is the characteristic of noise, maybe by maybe by using very very expensive and accurate instruments once you have calibrated what is the exact noise see you cannot have you cannot have that instrument every time so it is very expensive so once you have calibrated and found out what is svv now in the field you cannot use that instrument because it is so expensive because it may be delicate etc etc so in the in the in the field you use a normal measurement get the normal measurement from a sensor which is not so accurate and then you use your filter right that is the idea so <coughs> so if you know svv and if you know sxx then you can compute this filter using this formula now this is again this may be an arbitrary form but then you can you can approximate the form using some suitable relationship that is you will get some this will be a general function of z so now you have to you have to you have, suppose you looking at the function you say that if i uh, if i have to approximate this function reasonably well I have to choose a sixth order filter. Then, by choosing coefficients, I can match this frequency domain characteristic. That you can do. So you can estimate SXX and then fit a fit some pole zero model, eighth order, twelfth order, and then if you use that filter, then at least theoretically you can try to get XM. Now, still it is a non-causal filter. It uses minus infinity to plus infinity. Those problems are there. So, <coughs> we will stop here today, only we will note that see even for solving this problem there are two central hurdles which I have not addressed in this class. That everywhere we are using this Rxx, this Sxxz, where, where do I get them from? So, there has to be a way we have, we have to know if we, if, we, if we have to apply these, we have to know that from a given set of signals, how do we compute its autocorrelation function. The autocorrelation is in terms of distribution and all nobody will give me. People can only give me data. From there I have to estimate its uh, statistical property. So, it is very important to understand how do we from given a data, how do we compute a power spectrum, estimate a power spectrum and then use it for say in such problems. And how do we compute the autocorrelation? That is very important to know and that will took Nah, that will take up in the next class. Thank you very much. <laughs>